My name is Brenda Zahn and I'm a wildlife biologist and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Kauai National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And that complex encompasses the three national wildlife refuges on this island of Kauai. There are three species of North Pacific albatrosses that we might see here on Kauai. One of them is the Laysan albatross. That is a species that's the most numerous and they nest on Kauai. Now the Laysan albatross is historically nested on Kauai, certainly before people arrived, and then, and then they, they disappeared. And they didn't start showing up again on Kauai until the late 1970s. There was a pair that nested on um, an area called Crater Hill, but at the time it wasn't part of a refuge. And dogs killed one parent and the, the chick subsequently died. And year after year, a pair or a few pairs tried to nest, but usually dogs killed them. So it really wasn't until the, the eight, early 80s, mid 80s, when Kilauea Point National Wildlife Refuge was established and then we fenced the area to protect it from dogs and, and other predators, that the albatrosses actually started surviving and reproducing successfully. So today, uh, we have, on the North Shore, we have usually between 180 and 200 albatross nests on Kauai. Well, because Kauai has such a relatively small population of breeding lace and albatrosses, I mean, I think the survival of every chick or every individual is important in order to increase the population over time. So in order to increase our hatching success, and hatching success is simply how many eggs are laid and how many actually hatch. I can determine if an egg is viable or not, if an egg is alive, by a procedure called candling, and that's just simply shining a flashlight, a really bright light, into the egg. And depending on how, how developed that egg is, then I could actually see blood vessels and the embryo inside this egg. So the inviable eggs, once I determine they're inviable, then I can take a viable egg from excess eggs from the Navy base. They have a small albatross population there, which they, they're not allowing to nest because of the potential hazard of uh, bird aircraft collisions. So I can take one of their viable eggs and just simply replace this under the incubating adult. And that increases our hatching success here on the North Shore. But not only do they not know that you just switched an egg, later in the season when, when the eggs start hatching, if for some reason a newly hatched chick dies, um, I can actually replace that dead chick with another chick and they won't even know that that's not their chick. They'll simply raise that chick as if it were their own. The two egg nest has always been a mystery and there's really not much in the literature about it. And so for the last few years I've been tracking the pairs that commonly have had two egg nests year after year after year. And I'm wondering why, why are there two eggs? Because the literature says that a female cannot lay two eggs in one season. I mean, these are very large eggs. So it, that's probably true that, that one bird probably cannot lay two of these in, in one year. So that means there's another female somewhere that's dropping an egg in a nest. And this is all theory right now. I'm, I'm, I'm testing this now, but uh, some of these pairs, I'm, I'm wondering if they might not be female-female pairs. Sometimes it's something logical there. For instance, I believe there have been times where there's one male which has two mates. So in that case, the two females will often each lay an egg in a nest. In fact, one year I saw all three of them, this threesome, actually take turns incubating the egg. Well, once a chick takes that first jump off a cliff out here and, and fledges, that means he's, he's free from mom and dad, he has to just learn to fly on his own, which is that first jump, and then uh, he has to learn to feed on his own. He has to learn how to, how to find food, how to capture food, and, and he's at sea. He doesn't come back to land for three or four years. So once he leaves here, he's at sea. And where does he go? That, that's a good question. We, we believe probably up toward Alaska into the colder waters where there's uh, more food available than in here. How albatrosses find food is, I mean, it's all theory because we, you know, that's a part of their life that we are just starting to get a glimpse of with new satellite telemetry and things like that. But what we believe is because albatrosses do have a sense of smell, 
that perhaps they can actually smell oceanic uh, upwellings or continental shelves, you know, where the food sources would be available to them at the surface. Albatrosses don't dive under the water to get food like some seabirds do. They actually sit on the water and just dip their head under to get food. Well, an albatross certainly doesn't need to flap their wings very often. They have a six-foot wingspan, and it's, they're just designed to soar. They're called dynamic soars, and they rely, they need wind in order to soar. Uh, it's believed that as they're soaring, they can actually kind of, so to speak, turn off one part of their brain and actually sleep. They can sleep on the water, probably sleep in the air. They simply don't, really don't need to come to land other than to reproduce. So during this time period of age of, say, three or four years old up to about seven or eight, they generally don't start nesting for the first time until they're seven, eight, or nine years old. So what I call the teenage years, say between age four and seven, they will return to the colony generally from where they fledged from, and they'll, they'll mingle with other albatrosses, often of their age. And probably in search for a mate, maybe practicing their social skills, practicing their, their dancing courtship skills. But also there's a theory that they may need these non-nesting years in order for them to sort of map the ocean, find the areas where there's the continental shelves or where the, the upwellings are, uh, so that when they do nest and they, they're, they have to feed a chick, they don't have to waste time flying all over the ocean looking for food. Perhaps they know where to go. Because when they have a demanding chick back at the nest, they, they don't have time to fool around flying all over the place looking for food. They, they need to go out there, get the food, come back and feed the chick. There were two individuals that were non-nesters last year. Toward the end of the season, I would often see these individuals together dancing, and then they were together doing what I call the quiet courtship. Not necessarily the flagrant dances, but the just the, the head preening and just the quiet courtship, sitting together head to head. In this one area of uh, what we call Albatross Hill, which is one of our main nesting areas on the refuge. And sure enough, this year, the pair shows up and they're nesting right where they were doing all that courting last year. So it appears that, that they establish that territory and somehow they communicate with each other, like, meet me here next year, right here, so I can find you. And then that's where they, they'll come to the following year. The oldest Laysan albatross that was found was on Midway, and it was at least 51 years old and still nesting. So that, that's, that's all we know at this point. They can still reproduce apparently at age 51. Albatrosses ingest plastic. It's floating on the ocean surface. Perhaps there's some fish eggs attached to it, so when they eat fish eggs, they also ingest the plastic. Well, these same albatrosses then go back and feed their chicks. To feed a chick, they regurgitate. They regurgitate not only the fish eggs and the squid, but also the plastic. Well, what does plastic do? It fools the chick into thinking it's full of food. Many of these chicks, they die from dehydration because their stomach is full of plastic rather than nutritious food. On Midway, you know, with the presence of the military there, they use lead-based paint to paint the buildings. And of course, that's been chipping off over the years. And unfortunately, many of the albatrosses that are nesting next to those buildings, the chicks particularly, when they're sitting there you know, all day waiting for their parents to come back and feed them, they're picking at this paint, ingesting it. And then it causes some uh, debilitation, so what they call droop wing. It causes their wings probably not to develop properly, and then they won't be able to fly, and of course they would end up dying. These albatrosses, like, actually like all the seabirds here, they didn't evolve with mammalian predators. So imagine before people were on these islands, when this island was full of seabirds, they, they had no predators. They didn't have to worry about dogs, cats, rats, humans. And they just have not yet evolved to know that humans or dogs or cats or rats are predators. So they don't have that fight or flight response until it's too late. One dog getting in a colony with 17 nesting adults in a half an hour, every single one would be dead. And that would be the end of your colony. So all of these seabirds are extremely vulnerable to predators. Um, the predators are here, and they're, they're probably always going to be here. And unless we protect these seabird colonies, we're not gonna have them.
the bar.